Well, good morning. Um, anybody in here a morning person? <laughs> no. Well, I am. So hopefully I'll have enough energy for all of us. The <laughs> way I like to do this is I like for it to be very interactive. Um, I don't like to go by. I have some things I want to talk about, and I tend to do it more sort of like a conversation. And so I really hope that you ask questions along the way. Um, feel free to, to stop me. I think that makes it um, much more informational to you all and you get uh, your needs met during the discussion. The things I'm going to focus on today are, there's a couple of things. One is, what is our approach to eating disorders? In a sense, why do we think eating disorders develop? And based on that, how do we intervene? How do we intervene um, as a treatment and treatment team as well as prevention? And then within that, talking about our approach, that sort of sets us up to explain why we need to work together and why we need a multidisciplinary team to work particularly with eating disorders. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about our services. So in a sense, you know what we're doing with the same people you're working with. And I'm going to talk about what's been so helpful um, through you as a nutritionist working with eating disorders, what I have found to be really helpful in the treatment of our eating disorder clients. And so I'm going to talk a bit about that. And, and basically, the whole presentation today is to have the left hand and the right hand sort of know how they're working together and um, talk about how important you are to the work we do with people with eating disorders. So that's going to be the main focus. How many of you have ever known anyone with an eating disorder? A friend or family member? Okay. So quite a few. Okay. How many of you have ever read anything or heard about eating disorders in your classes? Okay. Everyone. Okay. And the next one, you don't have to raise your hand, but I just want you to answer it silently to yourself. How many of you have ever struggled with body image issues? Have ever not felt good about what you see in the mirror? How many of you have tried a diet and just felt like it failed and like you were a failure? Okay. My guess is that if I had done hands, there probably would be quite a bit because about 98% of women have been on a diet before and have struggled with body image issues. So what's real important about this right here is that all, everyone in this room has some familiarity with eating disorders. And also with dieting and body image issues, which are part of eating disorders. So you already have a lot of personal experience or personal information that can help you understand where this person is coming from, that can help you relate to them and be empathic to their situation. And that's really important. The rest of it you can always learn, but this piece um, sort of needs to be in place first. Let me tell you a little bit about my first experience working with people with eating disorders. I was working at a federal prison, and I was working on a substance abuse unit, um, doing a lot of group work, um, and it was a female prison, so it was all women. And I was doing a lot of group work around trauma issues, um, doing a lot of group work about uh, substance abuse issues, and I hadn't learned very much about eating disorders to that point, and then about half my group had eating disorders. Now my first you know, reaction was, oh my gosh, what do I do? This person could die. I felt very overwhelmed, even with all the training I already had in psychology and counseling. I felt scared by the medical consequences. I felt like I had to fix this right away. I felt a real urgency. Now I don't know if any of you can relate to those reactions as you think about possibly working with people with eating disorders. But it's real common for health professionals when they're first faced with someone with an eating disorder to feel helpless and to feel scared and overwhelmed. Now my reaction to that was I went and learned as much as I could, which is sort of my style uh, when I feel helpless, is I read everything. I got special supervision. Um, and all that really did help, but I think what helped the most was sort of the questions I asked you initially. What helped the most was for me to sort of put my helplessness aside and say, you know, I can relate to this person as a woman dealing with body image issues in my past. And this person has gone this long with this eating disorder, which is often years, and has survived and has functioned. 
And yes, there are some really serious concerns here medically that need to be addressed, but this person isn't going to die tomorrow. And so I need to slow down and I need to not try to fix it, which is just going to push them away and it's going to make them feel like they're a failure. And I just need to be with them and start from there. And that was the most important thing that I recognized. So I want you to think about that too. The other thing I learned from being on a substance abuse unit is how many of you have heard that eating disorders are an addiction? Anyone ever hear that anywhere? Okay. Well, that's where I started out. I started out in an addictions model. And what I found is it doesn't work. And I've found since then, I've realized that's not what causes an eating disorder. But at the time, I just realized the treatment didn't work. I mean, to try to say to someone, abstain from food, <laughs> Um, you're physiologically dependent on food, and also the addictions model basically just looks at the biology. And there's so much more. It's so much more complicated than eating disorder. What I found is, as I try to control them through abstaining from certain foods, carbohydrates or whatever, and ask them to give up control um, in this addictions model, that what happened is they try to gain control more and restricted more and purged and binged more. So I found that didn't work. And what I've learned since then, and the model that we use at the counseling center and the program that we developed about two years ago, is that in reality, and what the research supports, is that um, eating disorders are multi-determined. And what that is, it's a biopsychosocial model of where eating disorders come from. And I'm going to explain that. <laughs> What that means is there's some predisposing factors that set up a person to have an eating disorder. There's individual factors, there's familial factors, and there's cultural factors. Within the individual, we have sometimes, but not always, we may have a trauma history. That could be anything from sexual assault, um, childhood abuse, adult abuse, or it could be parents' divorce. It could be a really a very traumatic breakup with a significant other, a death in the family. Having someone else in the family, a sibling, which I find at times, have some pretty traumatic stuff going on. And so you, the person has the eating disorder is sort of dealing as a secondary person with this trauma that their sibling is going through. Maybe a physical disability, um, maybe that person uh, has a, a psychiatric disorder. And so this is the way they deal with it. Personality factors. Probably all of you have heard about you know, someone with an eating disorder maybe being more perfectionistic, wanting to be in control, um, being more passive or wanting to please others. I, each person is very different, and I think that we need to not sort of generalize too much. But there are certainly personality characteristics that might predispose someone. Um, and that plays into family as well, that often there may be some familial norms of being you know, in control, of needing to go beyond what's realistic and expectations, um, not, know, not learning how to deal with feelings in a healthy way, and so always stuffing them, um, those kinds of things that maybe a family culture brings up. The other thing with individual and family is biology in that sometimes um, we're often finding now that people with eating disorders have someone else in the family with an eating disorder or in their history, someone with depression, um, someone with an anxiety disorder. So there's a possibility of certainly a genetic link, but I think also with the biology and what we're seeing in families is that we're seeing an increase in eating disorders now. Well, guess who their mothers were and their grandmothers. Their grandmothers are the ones who started Weight Watchers. How long have diets been around? Anyone know? Yeah, just about. Actually, in the 70s, um, close to that, in the 70s is when Weight Watchers was sort of that first formalized diet came out, the formal structured. Um, since then, the dieting ads have increased huge amounts. Jenny Craig, Slim Fast, and you all know in this room just how well they work. <laughs> instead of healthy eating habits. So we have all this dieting going on, so they're learning in the family, they're learning from their mother or from their father certain eating habits, certain restriction, um, certain things about body. Also, 
once someone starts dieting, which I'm going to talk about, that also sets them up biologically for an eating disorder. Culture. There's another reason eating disorders started to come around in the 70s. Anybody know who was uh, our famous model in the 70s? Or, yeah, Twiggy. Anyone ever see a picture of Twiggy? She looks a lot like Kate Moss. And we started to have a lot of young girls who wanted to look like Twiggy. Um, and so we have all the isms. We have sexism. We have homophobia. We have racism. We have classism. And we have, but particularly sexism, playing into the cultural reason for eating disorders. So this is why I don't think an addictions model works. It's just too linear. And this is the other reason why we need all of us on the treatment team. We need the physician for the biological and medical consequences. And sometimes, any, and we need the psychiatrist at times for antidepressants or anti-anxiety. We also need the nutritionist, which is actually the first person I tend to refer to even before myself or a physician, to help with the nutritional aspects and the food and the dieting and to challenge that. And we also need the therapist, both individual and group, to deal with sort of the personality, the trauma issues, um, but as well as the cultural issues, as well as sort of challenging um, what, what young women think of as uh, what their worthiness, that their body size and their weight equals their self-esteem. And to start challenging that, to start challenging that, you know, culture defined that. We can question that. Anyone know who was a famous model in the 1950s? Very adored by our society. Probably the most adored actress and model. Marilyn Monroe, size 16. Twiggy and Kate Moss have not been our, our ideal forever. That was created by our society. And we can just as well uncreate it. We have some control over that. So this is the biopsychosocial model. Now these predisposing factors turn into perpetuating factors with the eating disorder. What happens is someone may have all of these and they're sort of set up then. What do they do? They start dieting. What do young girls learn as a way of feeling better when the rest of their life doesn't feel good? Well, I have control over my body. I don't have control over anything else. I don't have control over my parents getting divorced. I don't have control over these feelings because I never learned how to deal with them. But I can look better. And whether they're conscious of it or not, society has told them that women get a lot of bonus points for looking thin and looking attractive. So I'm going to feel good through dieting. Over 50% of people with eating disorders said that dieting was the main trigger. So they start dieting. The other thing that goes with it is dissatisfaction with body. They start looking at their body through puberty or a little bit after, and they start saying, oh my gosh, I've got hips. Oh my gosh, I've got a little tummy. And we're learning through culture. I mean, how many of y'all think that women are supposed to have flat stomachs? Yeah. It's not normal. <laughs> but we don't get that. What we get is normal is through all the models that actually they airbrush. So these aren't even true, real people we're looking at, is that our stomachs are supposed to be flat. We only get exposed to one body type. And it's a body type that fewer than 10% of our population naturally has. And so we start getting very dissatisfied with our body. We start looking at our body and saying, oh my gosh, it's terrible. I don't feel good about all these things in my life, or some things. And so I'm going to diet. And initially, they feel really good. Oh my gosh, I lost five pounds. Oh my gosh, I feel so much better. I got compliments. I lost weight. It's very reinforcing. But what happens is, through that dieting, as you all know, it becomes more restrictive. Over a year, they not only now cut out fats, they now cut out carbohydrates, as if carbohydrates are evil. <laughs> and then they're going to cut out protein. And finally, all we get left is maybe a little bit of fruit and some salad once in a while. And so it just starts going down, and they want to lose more weight. And the weight they thought they'd be happy at becomes less. And then what happens is they feel so starved and hungry, and they're obsessing about food all the time, that they start binging because they can't help it. They get set up for this eating disorder. And that's another really important point that we make at the counseling centers, that a lot of people feel so 
ashamed and weak when they finally come in and get help because they feel like I should have fixed this. I'm responsible. I'm making my whole family suffer and all my friends and I caused this and why can't I stop it? And they're not weak. They're very strong for coming in. They're very strong for reaching out to help because that goes against all their perfectionism and feeling like I should be totally in control of myself. That took a lot of courage. And often, I've seen very few people, although I have seen it happen, people actually recover from an eating disorder without getting some kind of help from some health professional. It's very difficult. You just can't, like all their friends often say, well, just eat. <laughs> it's not that easy. It's very difficult. Food becomes very symbolic of a lot of fears for them. So that's our approach. Any questions about biopsychosocial model before I talk about how we interact as health professionals? Any questions, reactions? Everybody's so quiet. <laughs> is this familiar to people or is it new? At, at the height of her career, she certainly changed body types because she went back and forth through her own dieting somewhat. Yeah. Yeah. If you ever see a picture of Marilyn Monroe um, in that little bathing suit, she has that bathing suit, she has a tummy. It's great. She has hips. And she's a very beautiful woman. But we've gotten, we've been so, um, what's the word, Rich? We've been so... Yeah, brainwashed is a good way to put brainwashed to think that this one type of body is attractive, that we start believing it. And what would the world be like if we were never told a certain body type was attractive and we were exposed to all different kinds? Gosh, that would be interesting. We might see beauty in every form and shape. That would be neat. Did, was that your question? Now, I know this is familiar to you. Katie was part of our eating disorders outreach team, which was fun. We go out and do prevention, and sometimes undergrads come and help, and we go out and do presentations. So she's been up here with me before. OK, I want to turn to this, our treatment team approach. And it's a handout you have. What am I doing? It's a Venn diagram. Is it in their book? OK, it's in your book. <laughs> I'm going to hold it up. Eunice was nice enough. I used to do this on the board that she actually did it out for me. This is a Venn diagram of kind of how the physician psychiatrist has one circle. You as the registered dietitian or nutrition therapist has another. And I as the therapist has another circle. And we have some overlapping areas. As a therapist, I'm going to focus more on um, issues like self-esteem, um, all or nothing thinking, trying to help them find middle ground, looking at replacing the eating disorders at coping, you know, doing some assertiveness or stress management, whatever's actually triggering eating disordered behavior. I'm going to try to help them deal with psychologically, deal with through um, changing behaviors, changing their thoughts, or expressing their feelings. A lot of what I'm doing as well, besides sort of challenging that rigid thinking and that all or nothing thinking about themselves, their whole world. And like I said, there's a lot of some symbolism with how they eat and how they deal with the world and relationships. I'm also going to be working with them on healthier relationships. And we do this a lot in group and sort of helping people um, relate to each other and talk about what that feels like. Often a person's intimacy decreases with others. They isolate, they feel very ashamed of themselves, and they're not quite sure how to connect to others. Um, and so we deal with that in a group situation. Also talk about family issues or trauma, if that is pertinent. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's not. But a lot of times there's at least some messages that, of course, are going to be handed down to the family from our greater society that the person learned. That doesn't mean that their parents are bad. They may have had a wonderful upbringing. But it, we just can't live in this society without having some of these thoughts and norms impact us. So we just talk some about that. 
a lot of what we're doing is psychologically helping them put control on the inside. In a sense, trust themselves, listen to their feelings, listen to their senses, and begin to be more aware of that rather than looking to the outside, looking to the models, looking to what other people think of them, um, making incorrect assumptions about themselves through external world and help them look inward. At the same time, you down here are doing the same thing and putting control on the inside through food and body. You're helping them um, know when they're hungry. You're helping them see that when their body actually craves peanut butter, they may have not eaten protein in a long time. Or that fat helps them sustain a longer time period because it helps them feel fuller. You know, so you're helping them understand how food is very important for their body and that they can trust their body on that. You know, our bodies are a wonderful creation. And when we take control outside of the body and we put it on the clock or we put it on, um, we put it on uh, calories or we put it on the scale, we're really taking control out of a machine that works lovely for us and is very intuitive. And so by doing that, we really mess up our body to the point where they don't know what normal eating is anymore. They wouldn't know hunger if it hit them in the face and where they don't know what a normal kind of healthy weight would be. And so you're helping them do that. We may start by talking a bit about calories and giving them a reality check that, you know, most women eat about 2,000 calories a day, give or take. We give them a reality check by saying, you know, 96 pounds is not probably enough. But in the end, what we work towards is having them decide when they're hungry, having them listen to their hunger cues, having them um, listen to their body's needs. So we give them some structure in the beginning, but work towards that. Work towards them throwing out their scale and just deciding when their body feels good and can work well, rather than a number. So we're both working um, on food and feelings, thoughts, but the sort of the whole philosophy of what we're trying to do is very similar. Now the physician psychiatrist is dealing more with those medical complications and believe me we refer to physicians quite a bit so that way both you and I can feel a little easier about is this person in any medical danger um, and have that person take care of it. So each of us sort of knowing the other person is working on a different part helps and allows us to feel less overwhelmed, less helpless, and feel like we can really focus on what we're doing. I feel really good knowing that you all are working on the nutrition because then I don't have to work as hard on that part. And also I know someone else is giving this person the message that, that healthy eating is important and not restrictive eating. Is someone else is giving that message that they don't have to be a size four to be a worthwhile person. I was telling Rich, I was telling Rich the other day, I think that um, one of my clients or in the training for the interns that one of my clients, I kept saying, you know, she was starving. Every night she was so hungry. She probably ate about 1,200, 1,500 calories a day. Uh, but she was so hungry and she'd been doing this restrictive eating for quite a bit. And she's like, but I eat enough. I eat three meals a day. Well, they were very small meals. Um, and I kept saying, you know, I think your body's telling you something. You're tired, you feel weak. I think you're not either getting certain food groups, and I don't think you're probably eating enough. Would you be willing to see a dietitian? Well, okay. So she goes to one of y'all, it was like a couple of years ago, and she comes back after the first session, and she looks at me and goes, as if it's a whole new concept, Brooks, I'm not eating enough. Did you know I need to eat more? I need to have snacks throughout the day. I need more of, you know, I need more carbohydrates and protein. And I'm like, that's great. That's great you've learned that. But you have more credibility than I do with that. It's very different to hear from a psychologist about food than from a nutritionist about food. So you play an extremely important role that even if I have a little bit of the same information, which I don't have the amount of knowledge you do, I still don't get that credibility. So it's really important to be giving similar messages. Um, so we're all working together. I want to cover a little bit where we overlap weight and culture and body acceptance. Before I do that, anybody have any questions so far? Okay, reactions? 
Coffee's not kicking in yet. Of course, y'all being nutritionists, maybe you don't drink coffee. I, it's my one bad habit. Um, one other thing about how important you are before I start talking where we overlap. Um, several years ago, I did, I came and sat while a student, um, she wanted me along just in case there was any fallout, um, one of my old clients, and she presented to some of her friends and shared with them that she had had an eating disorder. And she was concerned about some of them and talked about her recovery process. And she was better. People do get better. It takes hard work, it takes a multidisciplinary team, but they do get better. And so she was talking about this. And you know the person she talked about the most is helping her? Her nutritionist. And it was one of y'all in the class a couple years ago. Just how important that person was. They had similar, um, Eunice had matched them according to similar sort of hobbies. And um, this person was just really helpful for her and really making the shift and eating more normally. And she needed to eat more normally to do the work with me. Because when someone's not eating, you think back on a diet you were on, oh my gosh, you're so tired, you're cranky, you can't sleep. I mean, I don't know if y'all ever heard of that Minnesota study where all those men, they starved. We can't do that today. <laughs> but uh, they starved them, and guess what? These men developed eating disorders. Surprise, surprise. They became cranky, irritable, depressed. Um, they started to binge. They started to put ketchup in their food because they wanted different tastes. They obsessed about food, thought of recipes. So, you know, people start feeling that way. Then it's hard for me to focus them on their feelings or changing some of their stress management when it's really hard for them to think real clearly. So once they start eating more, they're more able to do that. So that was really important for that student, that that dietitian in her made such a connection and helped her so much that once she started to eat more, she and I could take off in our work, which was great. So if I can't say it enough, y'all are very, 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 very important. So let me talk a little bit about weight and body acceptance. If you can't tell, I keep talking about this whole issue about body size and how our culture is really skewed. Well, someone once put it to me this way, and so I'm going to put it to you this way, and it made so much sense to me. It's just, it, it, it's amazing how brainwashed we get. Every other human factor is on our statistical bell-shaped curve. Y'all probably read that in your science classes. Our eye color, our hair color, other factors about us, everything is on this bell-shaped curve. Well, for some reason in our society, we think weight is down here. <laughs> and that everybody should be, a, should be able to be a size 2 to 8, or 2 to 6. That if we just work hard enough, if we just diet enough, we can change that body size. We have as much control over our height, probably. It is a very natural, a very natural phenomenon that many of us have different body types. Now, it's true that many of us are in this average area of which the mean is not size 8, it's size 14. We're skewed on that too. But some people are actually meant to be larger, not the majority. And some people are meant to be thinner, not the majority. But we seem to not only have skewed this over and thought the average is here, but we seem to think that everyone can be over here, and they can't. Some people are genetically predisposed, pre I'm going to get this word wrong. Their predisposition is to be larger. Um, and I had a client once who was anorexic, and she was about 160 pounds, 5 foot 5. Now, according to those wonderful metropolitan height weight charts, she's overweight. Because of her genetic background, because of her family history and growing up in an uh, Eastern European, or, you know, her parents, parents grew up in an Eastern European country, um, being bigger boned, um, she was to be a larger person. She, sh her, her set point range really was around 180. She was getting ready for a wedding, and so she kept dieting down. She stopped menstruating at 150 pounds. Well, that should tell us that she was probably below her natural body weight. And so some people are meant to be larger. What happens, though, you know, we hear a lot about our society getting larger and larger. 
What happens though is people start going on diets who probably are in a healthy range. And what happens, as you all know, is they start gaining more weight. And so they do become larger than they should be. But if they had just accepted you know, where they were originally and done healthy eating habits and a healthy lifestyle, they probably wouldn't be as large as they are. And so what do they hear now? Oh, I'm much larger. I've gained 30 pounds over the last three years. I'm just not doing this diet right. I just got to restrict more. Well, that's not the answer. We keep giving them the answer that actually causes them to gain more weight and causes them to feel like a failure and causes them to develop eating disordered behavior. So one of the things that I'm trying to say here is that all of us need to get across is that there's different body types. That's real important. If we subtly give the message that they can be a size four if they just work hard enough, that they should be a small person, no matter what we do with them behaviorally or food-wise, we're giving them the message that, yes, you should continue this eating disordered behavior. So it's real important that we're all clear on body acceptance. The other thing is set point. How many of you have heard about set point theory? Cool. Yes, yes. It's a wonderful theory. Um, and I'm just going to, it sounds like many of you know it. Well, would anyone want to say what it is? So for me, I'm about 130 pounds, okay? Um, I eat relatively healthy. I had chicken wings last night, but tonight I'm going to have carrots and a pork chop and um, some carbohydrates, so I'm fruit. But, you know, once in a while, we all splurge a little bit. So I'm 130 pounds. My weight, if I, if I get into a rut of exercising where I'm real busy at work and I don't exercise as much, I might go up to around 133. Not very likely, not very often. If um, for some reason I'm stressed out and I'm not remembering to eat as much as I need to, I might go down to about 127. We've got about a three pound, three to five pound, men maybe a little larger range. range. And what happens is if I start gaining more, my furnace goes up, my metabolism increases, because my body really wants to defend the internal thermostat of 130. And so my metabolism is going to go up to try to get me to come back down. And like you were saying, I might try to lose a bunch of weight. What happens is my metabolism decreases. The furnace starts to burn less because it's trying to hoard any heat it can. And so what happens is my metabolism decreases so much, and this is what sets people up for that weight gain, that um, once I start binging, which I'm either going to die if I continue restricting, or I'm going to start binging. It's just a natural response. Um, I'm going to start gaining more weight and even go over what my old set point was and maybe develop a new higher set point. But usually we can stay right here. The body just naturally defends that without any just living a healthy lifestyle and not trying to control one's food as much. Remembering the food guide pyramid, which is great and using that but not trying so hard to cut out all ice cream all sugar all everything and so that's really important because um, the metropolitan height weight chart it's just for a certain group of people it doesn't cover the whole range of body sizes you know anyone know how many times that's been changed in the last like 20 years five times. So if they're accurate weights, if these are really truly ideal weights, why do they keep changing? An interesting point. And I find a lot of people that I work with don't fit those height weight charts. They're either really naturally a little bit smaller or they're not, and most of the time it's they're naturally a little bit bigger. So those are really important places. Intuitive eating, that's another thing. Y'all are reading that book, right? That's another thing we really emphasize at the Counseling Center that sort of, you know, is our overlap. Of course, we're not going to sit down and do that with them. That's y'all's job. But we really reinforce that so that we're sending the same message that you are. Eat to hunger, stop when full. Really trying to get them away from numbers and trying to do more of that. So we really emphasize that. 
And the other place we overlap is looking at middle ground, because a lot of people with eating disorders have all or nothing thinking, a lot of all or nothing thinking. So we're helping them look at middle ground and their expectations of themselves. You're helping them look at middle ground with eating. You know, well, this week, yeah, maybe you did you know, restrict a little bit more. But let's look at the big picture. You know, over the last three weeks that we've been meeting, you have really, you know, you're starting to actually eat a little bit of carbohydrates. That's great. You know, or, you know, maybe you can't start with 2% milk because that's so scary. That doesn't mean you're a failure. Let's think of something else. Let's think of non-fat yogurt or skim milk, and we'll start there and work our way up. So really helping them see that the world is very gray. And so we're doing that not only in the behaviors and problem solving, but we're doing that through our message that there's a lot of middle ground out there. Maybe they won't always get an A+, plus, but C's are okay once in a while. And maybe that particular partner didn't want to be with them and broke up, but that doesn't mean they're a bad